there's got to be a transitional bridge yes. where there's a new set of behaviors that you call up. You get that cue that brings up this instinct in you, and you got to say, okay, this is a cue for coping. I'm either going to go down path A or I'm going to go down path B. You got to teach them to recognize this is a choice point, and you have a new set of coping skills for this than blowing up the world, which I think is a whole new approach to domestic violence because that's where this dorsal striatum comes into so much play because in the domestic violence situation, it is so habitual. I mean, this can happen three, four times a day, certainly multiple times a week. So it becomes very habitual, becomes an overlearned behavior. They go on automatic pilot and they don't even think about this. Whereas if we can show them a red flag where they understand, look, this is what's happening to you here. What I fear is all the talking therapy in the world without acknowledging the neurological aspects of this. It's like them being on a racetrack with no exit ramp. You got to create an exit ramp for them to get off of this where they realize, man, when I get triggered this way, I'm headed for a big payoff here. And this dopamine flood is real powerful when I'm enraged. And I've got to find a way to get paid off without that. It just seems to me that this could be a really powerful protocol for helping those that are having problems with domestic violence, anger management, whatever. They're approaching this with purely talking therapies. It's oversimplifying to say they're being taught to count to 10, but there's more to it than that. If they need to understand this. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, the, the statistics are that domestic violence is the result of retaliation. One of the two partners in the relationship, and it's usually then it becomes circular and they both feel victimized and they're both seeking retaliation to make themselves feel better. And this becomes this vicious cycle. So it, a lot of effort was put into saying, well, men are a you know, a domestic abusers because it's about, you know, power and, and, and the battle of the sexes. And I think that that misled a lot of work uh, and, and didn't stop a lot of domestic violence as a result. If we start to see what's going on as is that this is a revenge gratification experience inside the relationship and it has become habitual, it fits all of the diagnostic criteria or virtually every one of them for, for a substance addiction, and then we start to treat and prevent the perpetrator. Uh, we make a lot of headway. But when I've talked to women violence groups, they often don't want to hear this message because they think that it's a light touch on abusers. Yeah, they think it's giving them an excuse. It, right. They think it's giving them an excuse and a free pass. And, and I'm saying it, it's not at all. It, it, this is, do you want to prevent it or do you just want to retaliate again and keep that cycle going? And it's been a bit tough to get that message across to that population of people. And I understand it because women are the, by far the most victimized and they've had it and they should have had it long ago. And I get that. But if you really don't want it to happen again, then you really need to use a science-based public health approach to it uh, instead of just relying on law enforcement to lock up every uh, domestic abuser. Because you, as you said, you cannot arrest your way out of it. When I was a graduate student, we had to go volunteer and do groups with child abusers, molesters, and those that had been arrested for domestic violence. There were these groups at the county, and we had to go. And I, of course, as a graduate student, I went down there knowing everything there was to know about everything. <laughs> I was going in there as the expert. And got a very rude awakening because when I went in with these wife beaters, I thought, boy, this is going to be embarrassing for them. They're going to hang their heads, be embarrassed to be there. Most arrogant, belligerent bunch of sons of bitches mm. you've ever met in your life. It was like, I'm here. She should be here. You're kidding me that I have to. I mean, they were no remorse in your face 
just total victims. Total victims. Total victims. They had been victimized by her, were being re-victimized every time they walked in the room. When I called on them to speak, they were being victimized again. And I was just sending them home just mega pissed off now mm. <laughs> uh, when I held them accountable. It's like I felt like I needed to call every one of their homes and say, you need to go somewhere for a couple hours because I've really pissed him off now. <laughs> right. Again, they were just victimized. I see now with the things that you're saying, and I thought about this when we talked several months ago, that so much of that was just setting it up to go to the next level of abuse because that just wasn't part of the protocol. So I went in there knowing everything, knew nothing about what to expect or what to say. And the wives need to hear, they're totally accountable for everything they've done. This is talking about defusing the grenade going forward. We're not excusing what they've done. They need to be full accountable. And if it's a year in the pen and that's what you need, then fine. But this is to keep you from getting killed in the future. Yeah, exactly right. And and you look at that uh, spiraling relationship and the resistance I get is, well, you know, there's no way that the guy is a victim. And I get that message. You're no man in the relationship would be the statement is enough of a victim to justify physical violence against this woman. And I, cu I couldn't agree more. But you need to open yourself up to, but the guy believes, is convinced that he's a victim. And he may be in some ways. Yeah. We can't just stop with the victimization. We have to acknowledge that it causes this uh, retaliatory flood of dopamine. And he is now moved into a violent offender out of his victim out of his perceived victimization even if a panel of judges would say you're not a victim here but he's convinced just as you found out when you walked in there they're going get out of here of course i'm a you know i don't want to hear she should be in this jail right now with me because look at all of the stuff that she's done and nobody's listening to him and you're right and so he's getting more and more pissed off and then he's going to go back and go now you got me arrested and now I'm going to come after you again, and it's going to be twice as bad because we've done nothing to help that man control his revenge cravings when he's been triggered. And it, you're right. You, we talk about drug cues and drug triggers, and that's what all this is about. It's that sense of injustice. And for men, it's about humiliation. It's about betrayals. I mean, a man who's humiliated in a relationship or senses that he's being betrayed in some way, that, boy, that is a powerful trigger for this desire to retaliate. And that applies up to Vladimir Putin, who believed that he was humiliated and betrayed and decided to invade Ukraine. I mean, it's not just in domestic abuse situations. It, it's at all extreme levels. Uh, but yet humanity has been messing around with violence for 5,000 years, and we haven't understood why, and we haven't understood these root biological causes. And so I'm, I'm just grateful for, you know, your voice in spreading this message because it's one that needs to be heard now.